sick people you had in Chicago, <laughs> or party people in Chicago. So, you know, he was just selling them, and they were just partying, and Walgreens was making a lot of money, and everybody was having a heyday during Prohibition. So that bottle was used. That was one of the original bottles used in Chicago during that, that era. Uh, can you give me any, an idea? It, like in the whole state of Illinois, they would only let four distilleries in there. So what might, if you had 220 distilleries in the state of Kentucky, you could just go sell to Illinois. You had to have a license to do that. So there were four licenses to do that. This bottle was used in Kansas, Missouri, Ohio, and Michigan. And I, from what they told me, there were two or three distilleries that were able to sell the product in those states. This one was used in the state of Kentucky. Um, there were 220 distilleries in the state of Kentucky and six got a license to distribute alcohol. So as you can see, we're just a, a small family run, family owned uh, operation. I own 100% of it. I don't have any partners or investors. I'm just, we just want to bring back a legacy that my great grandfather had. Um, as you can see, we don't have any bourbon out front. Our bourbon isn't ready. I made it, we made a decision that we're not going to buy a product from somebody, put it in a bottle, and say, oh, by the way, this is pure. So we make our own product. Uh, the only thing we have out now is rye whiskey. Our bourbon won't be ready until June 22nd of next year. That's my father's birthday. So in honor of my father, I, I wanted to honor him in some way. So we're bringing out our bourbon on his birthday. Uh, it's been 102 years since Peerless has put out a bourbon. It was 100 years since we put out a brown spirit, so we put out our Peerless Rye Whiskey on May 20th of last year. On November 20th of last year, six months to the day, we're ranked the number one rye whiskey in the world. We're ranked the 15th best whiskey overall in the world by Whiskey Advocate. Came out again about six months ago, we're ranked the number one rye whiskey in the world. Jack Daniels Rye came in second, Whistle Pig 10 year old came in third, and everybody else had 85 points or less. It just came out Thursday of last year, last week, that we're ranked the fourth best whiskey overall in the United States. So we're honored to have that. Uh, but you've seen our bottle maybe out front when you were walking around. My son Carson and Chris upstairs designed the bottle. And um, the company that, that we do business with, I'm, I'm kind of a, we're a military family, so I'm a fanatic on number one, keeping this place clean. Number two, doing business in the United States. So all of our equipment that you see is made in the United States. Our bottles made in the United States. When you turn it upside down, it says made in the USA. And we've got hats and t-shirts made in China, but I'm telling you, all the equipment is made in the USA. So I couldn't find a glass company that I was satisfied with. I don't want to pick up a piece of glass and look, I don't see anything green, I don't want to see any bubbles. And when I sit it on the table, I want it perfect. I don't want it wobbling. Or, so we found one company in Gwinnett County, Georgia, that makes our bottle. The only thing they make is perfume bottles, and we were able to talk them into making our bottle, to tell you the truth. So they sent our bottle to New York City on, on repeal day, that's December 5th. Uh, that's when Prohibition is over. They have a contest up in New York City. They have a convention. Who has the best bottle, who has the best label, and who has the best cap in the United States? First time in history, history is only 27 years, but I like to say history. <laughs> but um, we won all three. So you'll see it when you get back to the bottling room, the plaque that we won. So we're proud of that, that we, that we, that we won that. And um, we'll probably keep that bottle forever and kept forever. So um, again, we're, John will take you around. Um, you know, we're sweet mash. You always hear about sour mash. We're sweet mash. That means you clean everything every day and you start all over. We don't drag anything forward. We don't use something we've used the day before, three days before. So the reason we can do that, we're the most computerized distillery in the United States, probably the world. We don't say that. Vendome says that the largest still builder in the United States and the companies that did our mechanical work say come in there and find that. So you won't see any hoses on the ground. You won't see any gauges. Everything's computerized. We cook exactly at 212 degrees, turn it excuse me, exactly at 81 degrees, so we do it the way we want to do it, and I think that's the reason why we're highly acclaimed to be a new distillery, to have a number one of our whiskey in the world two years in a row. So that gives you an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. We appreciate you coming in, taking the time to do so. Um, 
you're welcome to take pictures. We don't hide anything. Take pictures. Mm -hmm. Go wherever you want to in this place. We, you know, we're wide open, and I um, think you'll enjoy the tour. It'll take about 40 minutes, John, and then we'll have a tasting at the end. So today we're coming, we're just coming out with our three-year-old rye whiskey. So today's the first day for the rye three-year-old rye whiskey to come out. So thank you very much. I certainly appreciate you coming in and seeing us, and enjoy the tour. I'll see you as you finish. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. All right, my name is John. I'll be taking you all around. Um, as he said, if you have any camera, cell phones, take all the pictures you like. You don't have to ask. So if you see something, feel free to snap away. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know if that's what I'm here for. Now, is everyone okay taking steps? Or does anybody have any questions before you're ready to continue? All right, well, if y'all want to follow me, we'll head right up these steps right here. Okay. You'll kind of look too if you look at some of the hand and stuff. You probably can't do much of it because it's deserve it. So far, it's pretty much good. Some upgrades on our pumps, um, some heaters, and some piping systems, and things like that, too. Hey, buddy. So, if you look back here on the wall, what's really interesting is when we were doing the construction of the building and we were bringing up some of these floors and walls, we found tons of these lined up in between them. Basically, they were used them for installation, but these are actually left over from the Walker Bagger Company. So, before they would actually stamp those big burlap sacks, you know, they probably practiced a little bit on paper. So you can actually see different, some of the feet, different types of feed and mash that they actually bagged up here um, at the distillery too as well before it's actually the distillery. So it's cool to still a little bit have a piece of that history from the uh, building. Now right over here, this is our 2,500 gallon cooker that we have. So one thing that makes bourbon bourbon, it has to at least be made of 51% corn. One thing that makes rye whiskey a rye whiskey, it has to at least be made of 51% rye. Now, corn gives you more of the sweetness, whereas rye gives you that peppery kind of spice that's in there. Now, you have your malted barley, which can give you a little bit of the creamy kind of nuttiness, but what you're really adding your malted barley in there for, it has all these enzymes that basically help break down those starches a little bit faster for us to give us some sugar. Now, 90% of your whiskey and bourbon come out of Kentucky basically for one reason. Does anybody know what that is? Limestone. Our limestone water source. And I'd say it's kind of like the backbone. I mean, literally, it's where you start is with the water. So when we go to add water into our cooker, you know, we don't have to source or filter our water. We take it right from the city line from the little tap water. That's actually what we're putting in there. Now, as you can tell, we don't have any hoses or gauges laying around. We have a computer system we run off of. We have one computer screen right there you can see. Then we have one in our lab for our distillers. But what this kind of allows me to do is I can pretty much control my operation from one standpoint. I can run my still from right there while I'm doing my cook. I can keep an eye on my fermenters. You know, I'm not running around, opening up valves, looking at temperature gauges and things like that. It allows us to be a little bit more efficient in our process and it actually leaves less chance for human error. So it's not like we can just start in and walk away. We do have to monitor the process. Um, but once again, it just makes life, e makes life easier on us around here. So for example, when I come in in the morning, I'm gonna start my cook. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my computer screen, I'm gonna press start. It's going to start adding about 1,200 gallons of limestone water inside my cooker. Now, once I get my water in there, I'm going to add in my corn and my rye grain. We'll mill all our grain on site, actually, and we'll see our roller mill here shortly. But once I get my milled grain, those grains are going to come right down that white chute into the top of the cooker right there. Now, the big thing you see on top of the cooker, that's called an agitator. It's just a fancy word for a mixer. It's going to be constantly mixing everything up for it. But once I get my corn and rye grain in there, I'll heat it up to about 200 degrees. I'll hold it for about 15 minutes there at that temperature. After that, I'm going to want to cool it down to about 145. And then I'm going to want to throw in my malted barley. So I'll mill all my grain. Once again, it's going to come down that white chute to the top. Once your malted barley gets in there, you hold it for about 30 minutes there at that temperature. After that, we'll cool it down below 100 degrees. And then we'll put our yeast inside of there. The reason we always wait, wait till it's below 100 is because if I put my yeast in over 100 degrees and say something happens and it sits there for a long period of time, that's actually going to be very bad for your yeast. It's going to slowly start killing it off. So we always just make sure it's below 100 before we add it in. 
Now your yeast will sit in there for about another 15 or 20 minutes while we cool it down. And then what we'll do is we'll transfer it up here in one of these fermenters. Um, we use what we call a swing arm station to transfer. So we use medical grade stainless steel piping for everything. So you can kind of see we have several different pipes that come off the back part of that cooker right there where the deck is. Um, then basically, you know, it's just a big bolt we unscrew and we move that pipe to whatever line we want to transfer to. Now keep in mind though, a cook takes anywhere between four to five hours. It really just depends on what we're making. If we're making rye whiskey, it's going to be very thick. It looks almost like mud. So it takes us about an hour long on the process for that cooking. Because um, it's going to take us longer to be able to heat that up and cool it down. Compared to when we're doing our bourbon mash build, it's going to be about an hour less. And we're going to get about two more barrels worth of alcohol out of the bourbon mash build. Can anybody tell me why? Why would I get more alcohol out of my bourbon mash than my rye whiskey? More sugars. Exactly. I'll be using more corn in my bourbon mash build, so therefore it's going to allow me to get more sugar, which means more alcohol for me. Now, right over here, these are going to be our 1,600-gallon fermenters that we have. Just kind of gather around and at least be able to see down inside of them. So what's going to happen, I'm going to get done with my cup. Well, then I'm going to need to transfer it up here to a fermenter. So the mesh is going to come out right here. It's going to start filling this fermenter up. Now, several things are going to start happening once we get our mash up in here. That yeast is obviously going to start giving us a lot of alcohol, right? And it starts going after the sugars. Um, it's going to start generating a lot of heat and a lot of CO2, that carbon dioxide you see bubbling off your fermenters that you have. So if we were to let this just run wild, that mash could actually get up to about 110 degrees, especially during those hot summer months. So actually what we'll do is we'll temperature control each one of these fermenters that we actually have. So you can see we have a little, this a little temperature gauge in there. So say I get my mash up here, I'm going to set this fermenter to 81 degrees. I don't want to get any hotter than that. Well, if it starts to overheat over that set temperature, that will actually communicate that back to our computer system. And then our computer system will automatically start pumping chilled water into these cooling coils. That allows our mash to stay exactly where we want it. We don't ever have to worry about it overheating. Now, towards the end of the fermentation process, before we run this through the still, they actually call it distiller's brew in the industry. I mean, it's basically beer. It's about 6-7% alcohol right now. Uh, I could come up here with a mug and drink away. It may be a little uneasy on my stomach, but I'm going to catch a buzz, right? And that's all I care about if I'm dipping into fermenters. Uh, but we actually have a great um, local brewery. It's called Fall City. They do a kind of a style of this. because We always get the question, like, well, could you just keep this in a beer form? Um, they do a style called Kentucky Common. It's about the closest thing. It's really good. So if you're ever curious what, you know, maybe a bourbon mash bill might be if you turn it into beer, you should go, go give them a shout. Now, when it comes time for distillation, like when I come in in the mornings, we do two cooks and two distillations a day. So we only make 10 to 12 barrels a day here. Um, kind of give you an idea of how small that is really on the distiller scale. You know, your bigger guys, they can be pumping out anywhere from 2,000 plus a day. So they do more in a day than we basically do in a year. But we'll do what we call dropping the fermenters. We'll come up here, we'll open up a valve underneath these fermenters and turn on a pump. And we'll take two of these fermenters and take them all the way down to this beer well right down here. Now this is roughly about 3,800 gallons. And this is just a big holding tank. You got to think, this is going to hold all our mash and slowly feed it into the still for us. So if you look like right here, we have a pipe that you can see where the mash comes right down here. It's going to start filling up this beer well. We have another pipe on the, out, on the other side. You can see it goes actually out of the beer well and then up over into this wall. And when we go see the still room, you'll see where it comes out of the wall and starts feeding into the still. Now, as Corky was kind of explaining, you know, we do several things different here. One of those is going to be a sweet mash process. So you hear a sweet and sour mash when it comes to the industry. We kind of show you how rare a sweet mash is. We're one of two places in the state of Kentucky that actually do a sweet mash process. So after you take all your water and grains and you run through your still, right, you'll have all this leftover they call stillage. Well, it'll take about 30, you know, anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of that. If you're going to do a sour mash, you're going to pump that right back in your cooker. You're going to keep on reusing those water and grains. Now, with us being a sweet mash, that means we're going to start fresh each time. We're not going to reuse anything. Um, that way, we get the full from those water and grains. You know, because of that, though, we're going to spend about 20% more in production um, just on water and grains, but also energy because we're going to have to heat up every batch, where if I take my leftovers, you know, it's already heated up as well. But, like I said, in our opinion, that's going to make a better quality product is using that sweet mash process. Now, besides saving money, the main reason people like to stay away from a sweet mash is sanitation. Uh, if you've ever done any home brewing, you know it's a lot of cleaning. So we have to break down and clean everything every day. 
So when I get done emptying my fermenters out, what I'll do is I'll spray these out, kind of rinse everything down, get everything flushed out. And then you can see we have a big tarp that's down over that fermenter. Because what I'm going to do, before I can put my next batch in here, I have to cover this up. I'll use steam. It will come out right here where the mash does. We'll heat this up to about 210 degrees. Hold it for about 30 minutes. Because what we're trying to accomplish is we have to kill any leftover yeast or bacteria that could be in here. Because, because we are starting fresh, it would contaminate that next batch that we throw in there. So once again, it's a lot more work for us. Um, but one thing I'd like to say here is quality over quantity. You know, we're not really worried about putting out the most. We just want to put out the best quality product possible. What is that scaling that's on the... Uh... So this is all left over just from the limestone water. That's actually not going to hurt anything. Um, occasionally, you know, every so, you know, three or four months, we'll come in and power wash it off. But um, we think it looks pretty cool. It's got all the crystallization on there and everything. And it's real gritty. It's like sandpaper, basically. Um, now, because we start with fresh water and grains, a lot of times we take our leftovers and we like to give it away to local farmers. Um, and they feed all the cattle with it. So we have a lot of happy farm animals because it's about 1% alcohol, which is why we have the best steak and pork here in Kentucky because of that mash. <laughs> now, if we can't find local farmers, then we just have to treat the, the pH levels basically and send it right down the sewer. Um, but if all possible, we like to try to really give it away. Any questions or anything? All right. well, we're going to head down these steps right over by the cooker, where we're going to head into the still. Now, when you get to the bottom of the steps, there's going to be a big fridge full of bottled water. Please come and put out the cooker there. And as we kind of go underneath, you're going to see where we have the medical grade stainless steel piping that goes underneath these fermenters. You're going to notice where I'm on the still. right hand side of the wall, you'll see where that pipe comes out of the wall, that feeds right from the beer wall. Now, if you're looking at these little glass windows on the front of the still, I want you to start from the very top and count five down, you actually see this pipe that comes from the left hand side of the still. That's actually where the mash will enter the still at. Because if you see, once it comes out of that wall, it's going to run through that thing on the ceiling, that's on a beer heater first. It's going to run through there and cycle through there and get heated up again. Because we have to heat up almost 200 degrees before actually let it go into our still. Now, as the mass is working its way down, below each one of these windows right here are these trays you see actually see up on the wall. Those smaller holes, that's where the steam is actually rising through when it's coming up from the bottom of the still. And it's going to rise through that plate and as the mass flows across there, it's going to grab that alcohol. The water and grains actually flow to the big pipe that you see. Because what it's going to do, it's going to do a big zigzag all the way down the still. So when it runs across that plane, it will drop down to the next one, run across, drop down, run across, and work all the way down. All your water and grain will work their way down, it will separate off into this tank. And like I said, we're not going to reuse any of this, so we either pump this to an even bigger tank out back, or we can give it away, or we'll just treat it there and send it right down the sewer. Now on the left and right hand side of our still, those are called condensers. So if you can imagine they have these little tiny cooling coils that basically trap all those alcohol vapors that we want and chill everything down to a liquid form. Now your alcohol has what's called your heads, hearts, and tails. Your hearts are what hold all that good grain quality if you want that, all that good flavor. Your heads, uh, they're a little bit more of the rougher part of the alcohol, some more of the harsh flavors that you may have. They're not going to be very um, tasty or, you know, very, very well received on your palate, basically. Now your tails are a little bit trickier because they hold the oils in there that hold a lot of flavor that we want to keep. But then they may have some of the harsher alcohol as well, like uh, you know, like that rubbing alcohol smell or that burn that you get. We call the Kentucky hug that goes down through your stomach. That's going to be some of those um, bad tails that we want to get out of there as well. So what we'll actually do is we're feeding our steam up to the bottom. It's going to get above through there. It's going to actually collect that first round of alcohol and send it to that condenser on the right hand side. 
That's what we're going to condense down some of the alcohol. Now, some of the bad alcohol that we don't want, those will actually stay in a vapor form, and they'll travel off the back pipe off our still, and they just go right out our rooftop. We have these two pipes that go right out the ceiling that all those vapors just travel right out. We won't collect anything here, actually. Now, from that condenser, it goes into what you call a low line tank. You have a low and a high line. It divides it out right here. Now, it's around 120 feet right now, but we still want to clean up this alcohol. So we're actually going to take all of our alcohol and pump it over into what you call a double. Well, from here, we're going to heat it back up using steam into a vapor form. It's going to travel up this copper pipe into that condenser on the left-hand side. That's where we're basically clean up a little bit more. We'll um, keep some of those alcohols in the vapor that we don't want, let them travel out of there, where we'll chill everything else back down to a liquid form, and then send it over to the high line tank. Now, this is our finished product right here. It's around 130, 131 proof. Now, as a distiller, you're going to have one of the best jobs. You're going to come out every 30 minutes and drink from the high line tank. Some of the happiest people you'll meet in production, if you can imagine, when we're up and running. But by coming out every 30 minutes, we're basically just checking for that good flavor. We want to make sure we got all those good hearts in there, enough of the tails and heads out of there as well. Because if something's off or, you know, we doesn't meet our standards, we can basically mix this through either part of the process to make, maybe make another run out of it. Now, by coming out every 30 minutes as well, you know, making 10 to 12 barrels, we're basically tasting at the beginning, middle, and end of each barrel we make, so we know exactly what's going into our barrels. Now, as Corky was explaining, besides the sweet mash, we do everything at barrel strength in our process as well. So we don't have a set proof that we go to. When we go to process and empty our barrels, whatever proof it is, we leave it. We will add absolutely zero water to it. We won't charcoal filter it or chill filter it. We run it through just basically a simple paper filter. So, what we'll do is we'll come off our still around 130 proof. Well, we go ahead and add our own water to it. We get everything down to 107. Then we'll put it into our barrels and let it age. By doing that, we've now turned that water into an ingredient. Because that water is going to go inside that barrel. It's going to pick up all that flavoring and all that coloring from the barrel. Compared to the most common practice in the industry is, you know, you're going to come off your still around 120, 125 proof. You'll add that into your barrels and you'll let it age. Now, after it's done aging and you go to process and dump your barrels, that's when they're actually going to add their water. Get it down to about 80, 90, 100 proof, whatever set proof they're going for. Once again, it's going to save you a lot of money doing that way. Because uh, by us adding our water on the front end, now we're going to need more barrels to fill, which means we're going to need more brick housing space. Uh, but, you know, we do 10 to 12 barrels compared to 2,000 plus. It's not going to make that big of a difference for us to do it that way. Now, right over here is our processing station. So all our finished barrels actually get rolled down right here. We're going to roll them up onto this lid. It's going to rise these barrels up where we can roll our barrels across here. These little rollers will actually come up and lift up two barrels at a time. Where we're going to take the bung out, we'll turn them upside down, we'll dump them right into here. So you kind of see this right here, this acts like a filter. This helps catch all those big char chunks that come out of the barrel. Because underneath is just a big tank that fills up actually with our finished product that we have. Once we get enough product in here, we'll pump it all the way over into this mingling tank right here. So all our batches that we actually create really consist of about an average of six barrels or less. We'll get all our barrels worth in here, our six barrels worth. And what we'll do is, this is where we'll run into one of our paper filters. We'll have a hose that comes off here. This is actually our filter right here. We'll connect it into the filter. We'll bring down a big stainless steel tote from the volume room. We'll actually set it down there. So as it runs through the filter, it will then pump into this tank for us, which then we can take down to the volume room for the bottling process. Any questions or anything? I know that was a lot to take in, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, well, if y'all want, we'll head out the door we came through. I'll meet you around. We'll head down to the volume room where we'll actually pass out, pass by our milling operation as well. Um, what's really nice is, so Clarkson actually designed this with a buddy of his, Ross, he's an engineer with the Louisville Speed School here. 
So it's really nice when I need to start adding my grain in, you know, rather than having to dump um, bags of grain or shovel grain into my mill, this is our roller mill right here. All that to do with that computer system that you run off of, say I need 2,200 pounds of corn. Well, I'll just put that weight here in my computer. After I put my weight in, I'll press start. I'll go over to whatever grain bin I want to pull from. I'll open up this chute right here on the bottom of this grain bin. Well, all my grain falls down to this piping system underneath. Now, inside of this piping system is this chain link system you can kind of see right here. It kind of acts like a conveyor belt. It's going to take all my grain for me. It's going to take it up to a second floor where it weighs it out of the weigh station. Once it weighs my grain out, it drops it right down into my roller mill. So behind each one of these knobs right here, you got to think there's two grinders that's milling that grain down as it passes through. Then we have another chain link system right there, a little pulley system that will take that milled grain up and drop it over down that white chute that you saw. We get all our grain from Consolidated Grains. They're only about 10 minutes down the road from us. We literally load these up on a truck and trailer, haul them down to Consolidated, fill them up out of the big silos and bring them back. We like to keep everything local as possible. If we can't keep it local, we won't source anything outside the U.S. here back in production. Um, so, you know, a lot of our grain, a lot of the corn comes from the Ohio Valley region. You know, rye and barley is a little bit more difficult, so a lot of times they will have to go up like Minnesota to get the rye and the barley. Any questions, though, about the grain operation? Right. Well, we're going to head down to the bottling room where there is actually heat in the bottling room. You know, we have our rake house right on site that's attached to the building that we don't temperature control, which is why we don't have any air conditioning or heat back here. We have to keep it as natural as possible uh, for our rake house. This bay to the left hand side, these are the big stainless steel tubs I was actually telling you about that we bring down and fill up. And you can see we put them up on a little stand right here where we have the hose that connects off of them that pumps in into need another tank into the bottom of Gotta do the whole lot of nothing, huh? Working hard. <laughs> okay. That's Tommy, one of our distillers, Nick, and then Drew, our bottling line. He pretty much handles all the shipping and receiving the bottling line. So this is our bottle right here that Corky is telling you about in the Carson design here to help with Chris stuff. It took him about two years actually to do this design. Um, we found a little company outside of Atlanta, Georgia that actually agreed to do our bottle because we were in search of what they call virgin glass. You know, we didn't want any recycled glass. We want to make sure it's nice and crystal clear for us so there's no color or anything in there. We started off by putting a solid piece right here in the bottom. As we like to joke around, it's our own little pedestal right there once our product's in there. We use Henry Craver's original, <clears throat> original, uh, original signature right there on top with the young picture of them on the label. You can see we have a real cork with that DSP Kentucky 50 across the top there. Now because we didn't source any product out, and that's not us knocking anybody that's ever sourced, um, we just didn't feel comfortable buying anybody else's barrels, dumping them into our bottle and putting our label on there. We just wanted to make sure people knew when they bought something from us that it came right here from this building. So because of that, no matter where you're enjoying this at, you look right here on the bottom of the bottle, see 120 North 10th Street, Louisville, Kentucky, made in the USA right there. So feel free, you can pass that around, kind of look at it there. It's pretty heavy, about three and a half pounds, I think, unfilled. So when we get our bottles brought in, we'll bring them in here on these pallets. <clears throat> Now, when we take them out of the boxes, what we do to clean them out is we actually just turn them upside down and we'll shoot some compressed air in there, get any floaters out, as I like to call it, for the packaging. We'll load them up on this round table. This just kind of rotates, and what it does is it's going to send these bottles right down the line right here. We have our first little camera right here. Once it counts out four bottles, this line will stop. These will lower down, fill up our bottles with our product. Then the line will pick back up again where it's going to come first to the corking station. You'll have one person putting that cork on the bottle, they'll place the bottle underneath here, and this will come down and stamp the cork on there for us. After that, after that they insert it right back on the line. It goes underneath a shrink wrap station. This cuts a piece of that shrink wrap, places it on top of the bottle, where it goes directly underneath the heater to get that nice tight seal around the cap. Now, if you notice on the bottom of our bottle, we have that little notch missing from the bottom of it. What that is actually for is when it gets here to the labeling machine. So when it gets down here to the label station, these rollers will come out and start spinning that bottle. We have another little camera right down here. It says it's on basically its own little algorithm in there. So as that bottle's spinning and it reads that notch, that's how it knows when to dispense that front and back label onto the bottle for us. 
After that, it comes off the line. <clears throat> this is where we'll do the final inspection, checking the fill line, the label, make sure there's no bubbling or scratch or anything like that. If it passes that inspection, we'll box it up, send it to a tape machine where it comes down here on a roller to another pallet because we'll wrap it up and ship it out here too as well. Any questions or anything? I'm not doing that good of a job. Uh, uh, Sunday, Monday? No, we do. <clears throat> the only day we're actually shut for production is on Saturday and Sundays. We're still open on Saturdays. We still have any production going on. Um, we took the time right now. So with the, we had a new brick house that just got done being built. It's off of 71, um, exit 34 on your way to Cincinnati. It will house about 5,300 barrels. Um, so we were kind of running out of room there for a little bit. Um, we were just stacking our barrels up here in the rick houses. We didn't feel comfortable putting them in anybody else's rick houses but our own. Um, so at that time, too, we shut down production. Um, Caleb, our head distiller, wanted to put in some upgrades. He wanted to install some new heaters, pumps, some lines, and things like that that will help us make a little bit better product, too. Always looking for ways to improve and uh, enhance the experience here. How much is a single barrel selection? So our single barrels right now, they run $1.20 a piece. Um, you'll actually get to taste our award-winning two-year rye um, small batch in the tasting room as well. Those will be running around $1.10. Um, the three-year rye will be $1.20. Um, and then we have them in 200 ml bottles of the small batch for uh, 30 But you'll get to try two of our single barrels hand-selected by our head distiller that we only sell in the retail. We don't release those out into the stores. And then you get to try our two-year award-winning small batch and our three-year with just came out today. Um, you'll be one of the second first people here today to actually get to taste our, our three-year. What we're going to do next is we're going to head right across the hallway right there over into the rick house where I want to talk a little bit about our barrels and just kind of our process that they do. Um, but they really stick true to the old ways of doing things. By that, I mean, when we come over there and see our barrels being pieced together, they're not coming down a conveyor belt, just kind of, you know, people just fixing them up. You literally have gentlemen over there shaving these down to stage, hand putting them into the barrel, you're putting the rings on and slamming the rings down on themselves. But they actually don't use any gas in the charring process, so they don't waste anything. They'll take all that leftover oak from the barrel stage and barrel heads and actually make these big oak fire pits that they actually have. But, so what it will start, they'll put, basically they'll come in what they call a blank. They'll shave it down into a stave where they start piecing it together to make a barrel. Now once they get the barrel together, before they actually do their charring, they do a light toasting inside that barrel. There's kind of a really good picture of it. It's about an hour long process, but what they're going to do first is they're going to get this wood warm all the way through. Think about it kind of like a marshmallow, right? If you take a marshmallow out of the bag and eat it, it's not nearly as good compared to when you slowly roast that marshmallow. You get it warm all the way through, get that nice golden brown outside to it. But what it's going to do, it's going to start activating those sugars, which helps give all that flavor. So 100% of your coloring comes from the barrel, and about 70% of your flavoring that you actually have come from the barrel. You know, there's over, from what I understand, over three different or 300 different compounds that you can actually pull out of, you know, brand new American oak. So by actually basically heating up their barrel first and doing a toasting, they're going to help get that sugar and flavor going inside of that barrel. After that, then that's when they do their chars. You have a char level 1, 2, 3, and 4. We do a char level 3 inside of all our barrels. Um, one of the most common ones, but you know it helps contribute to that beautiful kind of amber color that comes along too in the bottle. This picture right here, I like this one. This one actually shows you how far that liquid will actually seep down into that wood to grab that flavoring and coloring out. You can see that would be the inside of my barrel right there, and there's actually the line that it runs to inside of there. Now right over here is our beautiful Rick House in downtown Louisville that actually holds 2,000 barrels right here on site. It's the largest Rick House in downtown. Now as I was explaining earlier, besides our water source that we have here, one of the good things about Kentucky is the changing of the seasons. You kind of want it, you kind of want and need it to go from that hot to cold, hot to cold. See what happens is once we get our barrels up here, Especially in those hot summer months, all this gas and pressure builds up inside these barrels. It will cause them to kind of swell up, and that's what starts pushing your liquid into the wood. 
Now the colder months we have now, this is where those barrels will start to actually kind of shrink back down. And your liquid will start coming out of the wood and you start to get all that flavoring and coloring. Now, we only stack five high here, as you can see, so we don't actually rotate any of our barrels. Reason being, from top to bottom, you're looking at maybe, you know, five to four degrees temperature-wise difference. Um, you're not going to have that big transition into the temperature. Whereas, in, if you look at some of your older rick houses, you know, they may have three or four floors worth of rick housing. Well, you got to think on a hot summer day, from top to bottom, you're looking anywhere between a 30 to 40 degrees temperature-wise difference. So they're going to need to rotate those barrels to have somewhat of a consistency throughout the aging process. Whereas I like to say, we build out rather than up. Once again, it's a little more expensive, um, but as I like to joke around and say, all our barrels are going to be, be good. How hot is it here? What's that? How hot is it here? Um, you know, it gets pretty warm. Like this way, if it was in the summer right now, we'd be sweating, even in like shorts and a t-shirt. You know, it gets pretty hot. We have windows all along here we open up and then on the roof too as well. But I'm not sure of the exact temperature of what it is. Um, when we're done with our barrels, because we can only use them once, we have to basically give them back to Kelvin. So we just kind of rent them from Kelvin's. Because what they'll do is when we dump our barrels, we'll send them back. They'll give us a little bit of a credit. And then what they'll do is they'll break them down, and then they send them off to Scotland to make scotch, Ireland to make whiskey, and your winery and breweries will actually purchase these as well now to age their product in. Do you have any questions or anything about rickhousing, aging? No? Well, we're going to head right down this way in the rick house. Uh, now, if you pass by some of these barrels, you're going to see some signatures and things like that on them. No one actually owns these barrels. Uh, you know, we have a vent space that we rent out. Part of that is a private tour and things like that. So I'm not signing barrels. But what you will notice is this little gap that we have in between the ricks. So when it comes time to pull my samples, because you know, i got to go throughout my rick house and taste um, you know, every so often make sure what's in there is good. When I'm going through here, let me see, what I'll do is I'll just have my little pint bottles, and I can squeeze right down these little alleyways right down here. And you can see we have some plugs in here. So when it comes time to pull my samples, I'll go to the very top of the barrel, I'll drill a hole to relieve some of the gas and pressure. I'll come down about midway through, drill another hole, that's going to allow me to fill up my pint-sized bottle, and then we'll plug them back up with these little oak plugs that we actually have here. Uh, which makes it easier rather than pulling all these barrels off just to get the one barrel for a sample, kind of saves a little bit of uh, you know, man hours around here as well. Now we do have a cat that lives back here, so don't be alarmed if she, she does, her name's Char, but she does like to swipe at feet as you walk by every now and then, she's still very sweet. Any questions or anything as we're kind of walking down through here? So, this next stop that we actually have, we want to do something to really kind of showcase not just the bourbon, but that aging process. So we actually came up, or our head distiller came up with this idea, he called it a Series 1 collector set. So we actually only made 300 of these, so when they're done, they're done. We're actually not going to recreate them or anything. But he did one cook, one distillation, so these first six barrels actually belong to the Series 1. But when you purchase your Series 1 collection set, the first bottle you'll get, this will be your new make. Your unaged bourbon just right off the still. This first barrel right here, you can see it's empty. We dumped it at six months. So you can see the change that's taking place within just six months inside that barrel. Every December, we dump the next one. So we actually have a one year that we dumped. Then you have a two year. This December, next month, we'll dump our three year, then you have a four and a five. So if you choose to open up your series one, you can basically sample your bourbon through that whole aging process, understand all the flavor and everything that comes along with it. Now they're a thousand dollars for the whole set, but so I don't know if I'll be opening mine anytime soon. Mine will hopefully stay tucked away up in that closet. I even have Corky and them say, hey, do not give this to me no matter what I say to that fifth year comes out. Because <laughs> um, I don't want to do anything like open it up just yet. But if you have any questions or anything about that, just let me know. So we're coming up on the last stop before we get into the tasting room right here. You're going to see this barrel right down here on this rack. This is actually barrel number one. This is the first barrel ever filled in over 100 years here at Pierlet. <clears throat> but this is actually Corky's baby right here. He's never going to tap this open. He's going to let the angel share completely take this one to Henry Craver. He said this is going to be his great-grandfather's barrel. 
Um, God will love them for that, but it doesn't mean some of us aren't trying to talk them out of that decision. Um, you know, we would like to know what barrel one tastes like, but according to him, it's going to taste just like barrel number two would. Um, yeah, I know. But right over here, you'll see some of these that have 123 proof on them. You know, he's got some barrels set set aside for, um, you know, family and things like that, maybe some other stuff. So we have to call this a family rig right here. Now, because of this, you know, he has everything set up through a trust. It has to go through about five generations, I believe it's like 130 years. Because um, he likes to joke around, you know, when I'm dead and gone, the family come, can't come down here and fight for money. Let's come down here and work for it uh, if they want anything. Um, fortunately, he didn't have a daughter my age, so I'm not married into the family anytime soon. But we're really nice to the uh, sixth and seventh generation, Carson's two little boys. The joke is whenever they get out of prison, they'll probably come down here and run things. Um, believe me, it's like when they're here, you would know. They're climbing up in barrels, the rick housing, trying to fill up barrels, playing with all the equipment. Um, but it's normal to them to be down here. So I'm very nice to them, give them whatever they want. So maybe when they get old enough, they'll remember how cool John was to give me any family bourbon that may be released, too. What's the RC 53WG stand for? Uh, 53 wine gallons is what that stands for. Um, I'll always forget what the RC stands for, but it will come to me as we're in the tasting. I know it will. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go in the tasting room. Just grab a spot wherever there's a tray, get comfortable. But if you don't mind, hold off, kind of going through your glasses. I want to walk you through just to kind of show you what's in each glass. Uh, there's going to be a piece of chocolate. It's going to be very tempting, but hold off to the very end. I promise it'll be worth it. So let's head on here, relax, and get ready to sip on some rye. Hey, you're back here on the lucky day. Yeah. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. I think we have all the set up, too. You're not going to do the tour, then not do the tasting, right? <laughs> so if everybody wants, you can take that card right off the top of your tray there. So my tray is facing the same way as your own, so the pile's on the other side. So what we have here on that tray today, that first glass in your left-hand corner, that is going to be our award-winning two-year um, rod, small batch by Whiskey Advocate. Then we'll have our three-year small batch that just got released today. Then we have two other single barrels. We'll kind of get to him just a little bit. Those are hand selected by our head distiller um, just here for the distillery. So what's really nice about those is talking about the aging process because these are all about whiskey, all the same mash bill, but you get to kind of see how they're going to age differently inside those barrels. So let's go ahead and start with our two year right there, that glass right there in the left hand corner. But what I like to do first is what they call nosing. So the trick to this is make sure you keep your mouth open. Breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Now everything is barrel strength. So once again, this is actually going to be a 108.5 on the two year small batch that we have here. <clears throat> you notice it's got those delicious caramel and vanillas in there, a little bit of floral to it as well. Um, when you think of traditional rye whiskey, you really kind of only think of like oak and pepper. Um, there's a lot of spice and heat to it. But you're going to notice we have a little bit more well-balanced complex because we're still going to keep those traditional oak and pepper flavors around, but you're going to notice we're going to have a lot more sweeter notes in there and floral notes compared to a typical rock. Now, when you take that first sip, <clears throat> make sure you don't take a big gulp. If you take out the kind of like a big gulp off of it, it's going to put your taste buds into shock. You're going to get a lot of alcohol and very little flavor out of it. So as I like to say, sip and savor. You want to take small sips, just enough to kind of cover your tongue and like cover your taste buds when you're trying to warm up. So as you know, it's got a very sweet entry to it. You get that traditional kind of oak and pepper as it runs across your palate. But then it transitions nice. into a little bit of a citrus with a nice kind of chocolate finish to it. What do I think of the two year? Good. Now, if you can, take a little bit in each one of your glasses for the very end. So next we'll move on is to the three-year rye we have here. 
So what you'll notice in this one when you go to know this, this is going to be a 109.1 truth. You're going to notice the aroma is a little bit more present in this one. It's got more of a fuller body on there. Strong presence of caramel, vanilla right out the uh, initial nose with a little bit of hints of like a tobacco in there. Now when you take a sip of this one, you're going to notice that the age in that barrel over the year. It's going to have a little bit more of a creamier mouth feel to it. Still, once again, you get that traditional kind of oak and pepper. Um, you can kind of see where the spice and heat is kind of tamed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I've done it for three years. Tell the difference between the two. Well, the next class we have there, this is going to be our first single girl that we're going to try. This one we call it a harvest. It's going to be a 108.9. Now this one right here is going to be a little bit different than the two or three year small batch because this only came from one barrel. Now this one's going to have more of an oily mouth face. So if you have any scotch lovers out there, it may remind you somewhat of a scotch. Because off the nose you're going to notice it has more of like a fruity kind of earthy tone to it. There's sweet grass, sweet hay. And when you take a sip of this one, because of those oils in there from us non-shell filtering it, it's really going to coat your mouth almost like a scotch. You're going to have a nice kind of an earthy kind of a full perfume essence to it. So once again, it has that sweet entry, you get a little more spice off of this one um, for me. But it still has a great kind of chocolatey earthy finish to it. Alright, last but not least on that tray there. This is our other single barrel. This one we call it a smoke old fashion. This was actually um, selected too, also by one of our bourbon brotherhoods here, here in Kentucky. Now you'll notice on the nose on this one, this one's going to be a 109.1 proof as well. It's got a nice smoke, kind of a spiced cherry notes to it. And when you take a sip of this one, for me it's kind of that smokiness, a little bit of cinnamon, spiced cherry. It's almost like a simple syrup sweet with a little bit of a burst of like a citrus peel in there. So to us, it's like you know putting a couple of ice cubes in here, sipping on it, reminds me just of an old fashioned. But now you have that piece of chocolate in front of you. That is made by Art Eatable, so right down the street from us. They do an amazing job. It's made with our rye whiskey in there. But it's going to be a great pairing with the rye. So what you want to do is you want to take a little bite of your chocolate and sip on your different glasses. Because you'll notice when you pair the chocolate with our rye, it's going to change the flavor profile up in a little bit. And you're going to have certain spices that kind of stand out too in there when you pair it with the chocolate. So feel free now. You can go through, sample your different glasses with your chocolate, blend them together, whatever you like. Uh, let me know if any of y'all have any questions. How'd y'all enjoy everything? Very good. Good? Very good. 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 See anybody have a favorite there on the tray? That one was called Smoke Old Fashioned. It's a, it's a really good unique barrel. Now we have two other ones out there you'll also see on the shelf. We have one called Sweet and Savory. Um, you know, we can only pour so much so we have to rotate out the single barrels we sample. Um, just because I know a lot of them are that 1.75 ounces But we have one out there called Sweet and Savory, which is another one of my favorite single barrels we've released here. It's got a nice sweet kind of uh, entry, but it really kind of transitions to like a smoky kind of a brisket almost. So it really doesn't have like a chocolate finish to it. Uh, then we have another one called Brunch, which is going to be more like a maple syrup, kind of like a sun tea kind of a flavor to it. But it's also going to have a nice good oily mouth taste to it as well. So it's a little, a little kind of which one was that? That one's called Brunch. It's out there around the Series 1 collection out there. And those are actually signed by our head distiller on those bottles. That was another good one that we had here. Um, we just, you know, try to rotate every so often so it gets down to about five, six bottles, and then pull it off, seven, nine, eight, 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 eight. Well, I hope you all enjoyed everything. We have any Bloody Mary fans here. We have the best Bloody Mary mix. You have to sample it, ask them at the front desk. Um, but we don't put vodka in them. Vodka kind of reminds me of like bad college days. You know, that's kind of <laughs> your back. Uh, oh, rye whiskey and a Bloody Mary is very good. Rye already kind of has a little bit of spice and kick to it. So if you like to kind of amp up your Bloody Mary, I always suggest rye whiskey is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once again,
once again, thank you all for coming in today. I really do appreciate y'all coming by, taking the time to see us with our crew here coming out today. Um, plus, we get to drink at the end of each tour, so you know we don't mind walking you know, through the i try to keep everybody out of that side. I'm sure everyone's just wondering what the heck you're doing most of the time. Last week you put in like 50. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's our two years, three years, and then uh, these are both single barrels, and they're three years as well. You're welcome. Where y'all? Y'all headed off anywhere else? Home. 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 <laughs> if anybody's looking for suggestions, Copper and Keens is another great facility here in Louisville. Um, now, they don't do whiskey or bourbon. They're a brandy distillery, but they also do gin and athletes as well. Um, and they have a bar there called Alexander. You can go down there and get a cocktail. They're just at the other end of Maine in what they call Butcher Town. Um, love them. You should definitely stop by there if you're looking for something a little bit interesting. Well. Copper and Key. They, uh, they use, like, they have a bunch of those old storage <coughs> containers out there in front that they kind of built up everything on. Uh, it's just great vibe. Yeah. Yeah, I went there for a cool for event that night. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a big fan of bringing it. Then I had a Wisconsin old fashioned one in the train, and they were yep. super good. Yeah, I didn't realize it was a plan. Have you ever get, you said you're from there? Yeah. Have you, uh, have you ever been to Oscar Slider Bar yet? It's on Top of Little Road. Okay. Right as you turn right to go. Old pizza place. You need to go there. You need to go there. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the stream. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Have a great day. This was the uh, Peerless uh, three-year Rye release um, event. Hope everybody enjoyed the tour and the event. Have a great day.